On July 13, 1969, Dr. McGugan is Senior Consultant for the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, University of Nebraska College of Medicine. I am Bernice Hetzner, Emeritus Professor of Library Science, former director of the University of Nebraska Medical Center Library, now known as the Leon S. McGugan Medical Library. Dr. McGugan, uh, when did you decide to enter medicine? Have you always wanted to be a doctor? I've always um, had a, a desire to be a, a physician since I was um, a young lad in um, grade school. I um, went through um, high school in my freshman year in Sheridan, Wyoming, and um, my last two years at the Lincoln Central in Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, when I finished high school, enrolled in the um, College of Arts and Science at the University of Nebraska at Lincoln in um, September of um, 1918. My um, courses were tailored towards um, the pre-medical uh, courses uh, with the expectation of eventually uh, applying um, for medical training uh, either at uh, the University of Nebraska in Omaha or some other um, medical school, preferably one on the East Coast such as Harvard, Penn, or Hopkins. Um, I spent three years on the campus in Lincoln um, with my courses um, somewhat tailored towards science, but uh, still uh, with many of the humanity courses uh, in my curricular group of studies. And this latter group of studies I uh, enjoyed very much and have subsequently realized that a wide basic training in humanities uh, for medicine is a most important portion of pre-medical training and that the student who does this is more likely to be more widely read and uh, a better um, trained individual as far as um, basic education and um, understanding people and people's problems um, than the individual who spends most of his time in the science courses. This particular facet of uh, pre-medical education seems to have been abandoned in subsequent years and it is only in the last three or four years that I have noted um, articles in the current literature in medical education uh, that there is a re-emphasis again on the humanities and basic training um, in the um, non-science group of college uh, requirements. Um, during my um, last two years in uh, studies at the Lincoln campus, uh, uh, my family had some financial reverses. This would be your second and third, third year, year at the university. Yes. I um, decided uh, because of uh, financial situation that it would be more um, proper to um, enroll if possible at um, the University of Nebraska College of Medicine in Omaha. An application was made uh, for that particular um, medical school. Uh, I was accepted um, by the then Dean, Dr. Irving Cutter. Yes. <laughs> um, and incidentally, I have recently given Mrs. Hetzner a um, copy of that letter, or of the original of that letter of acceptance. My family had um, reached an agreement with me that uh, if at the end of my two years at um, first two years at um, Omaha, 
that if I were um, successful in um, finishing those two years and had um, the basic requirements and the fin financial situation was such that it could be arranged, that I would uh, express my uh, former desire of uh, going to Easter school by making application to one of the Eastern schools and possibly being enrolled, period. Um, I did apply at uh, several schools and was accepted at the University of Pennsylvania and entered um, the junior year there in the uh, fall of 1923. Um, the, um, did you find the atmosphere and the, the academic uh, uh, community there much different than the campus in Omaha? Uh, yes, there was quite a difference. In fact, after I had been there about uh, two weeks, I would have um, been very happy to pull up stakes and come back home. <laughs> in fact, I think I was probably lonesome and a little homesick. But um, very shortly, I, I adapted uh, to the different curriculum uh, and the different uh, methods of education that they had there. Since I was now in clinical years instead of preclinical years, I would have probably had the same trouble at Omaha. Um, mm -hmm. But I thought most of it, my problems there in adoption was um, adoption of the environment rather than uh, for medical education. Mm -hmm. um, school turned out to be very pleasant. Uh, the um, classmates that I had there were all very helpful in, in, a, in an adjustment. Um, one very interesting facet of my undergraduate uh, work at Pennsylvania was the fact that um, I lived in the Whitey House. Um, there were about uh, 30 of us who were in school, at members of the chapter who lived in the chapter house. There were only four of us who came from north of the Mason-Dixon line. And uh, we fought the Civil War every morning for breakfast. <laughs> um, I came from Nebraska, so consequently I was originally from the Nebraska Territory. So uh, both the north and the south uh, elements ruled me as neutral and I could argue either way without any difficulty. I had one other advantage that my grandfather, um, who was a physician in New Orleans, had uh, been a member of the um, Confederate uh, Medical Corps in the, in the Civil War, uh, unfortunately lost his life uh, before the war was over. But uh, the Southern group uh, really accepted me on that sort of a basis and thought I was a, a damn Yankee uh, by birth only and not by actual birth. Um, I finished um, my schooling in, in um, University of Pennsylvania, graduating from there in June of uh, 1925. Um, I uh, had applied for an internship um, at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania, and I was accepted there. Uh, the internship was uh, interesting in, uh, in its conception of format in that it was a two-year internship um, given over to um, minor subjects in uh, medicine uh, for the first year uh, in segments of a little over five weeks apiece. Why do you tell me what you mean by minor subjects? Uh, we had um, one segment on uh, pediatrics one segment on orthopedics and neurology, uh, one segment on obstetrics, one segment on UIN, um, two segments on pathology. Mm -hmm. um, and I off the top can't give you the other nine, but, and then we uh, had nine, uh, correction, six months in uh, general medicine and uh, six months in surgery. Um, Pennsylvania also uh, differed a little bit um, uh, in its licensure program in that um, you could not take your state board examination until you had been officially credited with your internship. Wasn't it that way at Nebraska at one no, time? No, you, you took your licensure when you graduated from school, when I was enrolled here. There was a short time when you had to uh, take a year of uh, internship before you could take your, or before you got your degree, basically, I think. 
but there was, yes, a, there was a variation in there. Mm -hmm. But at Penn, uh, I did not take my medical licensure examination until uh, July of 1927, two years out of school, seven years from anatomy, <laughs> <laughs> or six years from anatomy, and it entailed a tremendous amount of study uh, during the time that I was doing a very heavy uh, internship at the same time. Um, the internship was different, uh, too, in the fact that um, most hospitals in those days did not accept um, married individuals for their internships. Um, the uh, pay was board and room and laundry. Um, time off can varied with the different hospitals at the University of Pennsylvania. Your time off was regulated by your ability to get somebody to take your calls while you were gone. Um, and um, that meant that your work had to be completed before you could get off. Nobody yes. would yeah. take your calls until your work was all done and then they knew they were coming on a clear service. Mm -hmm. So that Please. many of us went um, a week or 10 days at a time without ever getting out of the hospital except maybe to uh, go to the corner to get a newspaper or an ice cream cone or uh, do an errand of getting mail or something that way. Um, we were allowed uh, two weeks vacation each year and uh, that was always cared for by the chief resident who covered our service by substituting another individual in that service. Uh, I stayed on for one year after completing my internship uh, in the Department of Gynecology where I was chief resident. Uh, and from there, <coughs> uh, went to the Royal Victoria Montreal Maternity Hospital in uh, Montreal, uh, period. Um, this hospital uh, is the teaching hospital in obstetrics and gynecology for the, Royal Vic for the um, McGill University. But this is uh, both OB and GYN. But my residency program was uh, entirely devoted to obstetrics in the year that I was at, uh, at uh, the Vic. Um, the experience in Montreal was um, interesting in that um, I came into contact with a, a great many Canadians. Uh, I came into contact with um, faculty who had uh, most of their um, formal education abroad, particularly in uh, Scotland, Ireland, and, and um, England. And um, I have formed many uh, friendships there which have persisted until this day. Mm, um, incidentally, of the 11 of us who were residents at that time at the Royal Vic. Um, all of us reached a professorial rank in either obstetrics or gynecology or one of its branches, um, which is a very unusual record. That's an amazing record, yeah. Were they mostly from Canada or were they United States citizens? Well, um, most of them were, were Canadian. Um, one of my mm -hmm. uh, fellow residents was Dr. Newell Philpott, who originally came from Chicago, but stayed on at the Royal, uh, stayed on at McGill as a teacher. Eventually became um, chairman of um, obstetrics and gynecology and director of the Royal uh, Victoria Montreal Maternity, um, president of the American College of Surgeons, um, and uh, I hear from him every now and then. This was quite a distinguished group that you were with. Yes, it was. <laughs> In fact, they said it's the most distinguished group that's ever gone through and completed the residency program at the Royal Victoria Montreal Maternity. Uh, following uh, my completion, my record at, uh, um, internship at, um, and residency program at McGill and the Royal Victoria, I, uh, had doubts as to whether I wanted to stay on in an academic environment or whether I wanted to go to a non-academic environment. 
and decided the only way to do that was to live in a non-academic environment for a year. And so I accordingly went to Fall River, Massachusetts, where I was offered a position in a clinic. And half time in general surgery and half time in obstetrics. Hmm. Um, I enjoyed my um, year at the at the Fall River. Um, again, in a new environment, in a very old part of the colonial area of the United States, with uh, many definite uh, restrictions as to um, who you went out with and who you saw, uh, depending somewhat upon um, how far your forebears went back to uh, <laughs> <laughs> the days of Plymouth Rock. <laughs> yes, a little of that still exists back there, I believe. <laughs> um, I used to go up from Florida to Boston to um, the Boston Lying in every week or so on Thursday afternoons and spend some time at the Boston Lying in with Dr. Frederick Irving, who at that time was professor and chairman of the department at uh, Harvard. I uh, discovered uh, from my associations at Fall River and my associations at um, Harvard that I really wanted to stay in an academic environment, so I began um, searching for an academic area and, and um, after a considerable amount of um, searching for a location, decided when the opportunity was offered to come back to Omaha and um, entered private practice uh, with the late Dr. Charles W. Pollard, who was then chairman of the department. and accepted in a teaching position at the University of Nebraska College of Medicine as a, an insistent instructor. That started at the bottom, hmm? The lowest rank on the teaching ladder. <laughs> um, as far as the uh, campus was concerned when I came back, um, now this would be when, 1920? This was December of 1930. 1930. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And how do you find things here then? Uh, the, the, the weather was as I had remembered it when I was in school. <laughs> um, the campus at that time um, was winterized. None of the flowers were in bloom that uh, were in the uh, front garden, which uh, the English gardener Darcy, Darcy. had uh, so carefully developed mm -hmm. over the period of years, and which was one of the pretty sites in the city of Omaha in those days. And the campus itself consisted of the North Building and the South Building, um, Conkling Hall, the first and second units of the hospital, as, as well as the heating plant, uh, Darcy's greenhouse, <laughs> and one or two other small um, area buildings. Back of the um, hospital is the um, remnants of the um, track where some of the boys used to keep into practice with running. The nurse's dormitory had already gone, burnt down, right? Yes. That I don't oh, remember. Oh, yes. Yes, because Conkin Hall was open, yeah. yes. But there uh, was a track there where the cross-country yeah. runners yeah. trained. Um, hospital um, capacity then was small, I don't remember the exact bed capacity at that time. The administration offices were on the first floor. The um, 
residents lived on the fifth the, the house officers lived on the fifth floor. Mm -hmm. uh, surgery they... surgery consisted of two operating rooms and an amphitheater. In unit one. In unit one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the library was in uh, unit two, where it stayed until 1960. 70. 1970. 1970. I was going to say 69, but 70 is right. Um, and even in those days, it was a little crowded. Well, I don't believe they had the mezzanine floor yet then. Um, they just had one level of stacks. I don't remember. Were they having trouble um, equipping the second unit of the hospital and paying for staff? I don't remember all of those particular details, Mrs. Hetzner. Uh, the second unit, the top floor, the north end was a private psychiatric wing. Mm -hmm. um, the top unit on the south end um, was a student laboratory for clinical clerks. Oh yes, it was that way when I came. And <laughs> um, um, the rest of the actual ward assignments I would have to get out and take a look at. As I recall, wards A and B were medicine, C and D were surgery. Mm -hmm. um, the south half of the next floor, the third floor, was OB. The north half was um, not GYN yet because we didn't have a GYN department. It was in general surgery. Mm -hmm. And over on the other side, um, Ward H was women's medicine. Women's medicine, yes. And the next two floor, the next uh, floor up was um, neurology, orthopedics, and pediatrics. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it remained that way for some time, because and, uh, it was that way in the 40s. The dining room and the 50s. kitchens were on the first floor of Unit 1. Yes. The emergency room, which was about 8 by 10 <laughs> in yes. size, yes. was yeah. on the north side of the ground entrance. Okay. Well, now, when you came back in 1930, Dr. Keegan was dean? No. By that time, Pointer. No, Dr. Pointer was dean. Pointer was dean. Through mm -hmm. some, a good many letters that uh, I had with Dr. Pointer, and I'm sorry that I don't still have those letters uh, from Dr. Pointer in regard, or from Dr. Pollard in regard to coming back and, and beginning work in Omaha. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pointer was the dean at that time. Mm -hmm. He had been uh, professor of anatomy in my freshman year, and he was uh, most uh, helpful and encouraging and urging me to come back to my other practice. Um, Do you, um, would you care to comment about the other deans that you've served with? He's, how did you, you know, Pointer is one personality and he was followed by Luth it was a different personality. <laughs> Doc, uh, Dr. Harold Luth was uh, appointed, I think, after Dr. Pointer, is if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, he came from Illinois, um, was not very well liked or received by a great many people on the campus. Uh, they thought he was a little too aloof and uh, not sympathetic with uh, either student or faculty or patient problems. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, next dean was... Um, Barry Tillman. Oh. <coughs> mm -hmm. I, I well, will, we I'll have a, to say, I'll have to say that... Um, we had an, excuse me, didn't we have an acting dean, Reuben Saxon? Oh, that part I don't remember. We might have. <laughs> but before Dr. Luth retired or, or left Omaha, um, we had a very urgent problem in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Um, the chairman of the department um, was relieved of his duties as chairman. Yes. 
and um, stayed on as a professor for a while. And I think I've given an account of this in the history of the department. But um, at this particular time, um, when I was approached as to being acting chairman of the department, both Dr. Luth and uh, Dr. Gunderson, who was chancellor at Lincoln at that time, mm -hmm. uh, were very helpful, very warm, uh, and very encouraging in, in uh, asking me to step into the vacancy at that time. Um, my respect for Dr. Luth and my liking of him increased during that particular controversy. <laughs> As he did yeah. seem to take a, 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 a side and, and eventually sided with the faculty um, rather than the individual. Even though the, the individual was from the same hometown. Well, right? that doesn't. Um, <laughs> yes, he was, from, he was also from the same hometown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Perry Tolman. Um, became a. Uh, uh, full-time dean, and there may have been a time when Reuben Saxon was acting dean, I don't remember that. We are, oh, if, I, if, if it did happen, I don't recall it at the time. We, um, as I recall, and we of course can check the records, is that uh, Perry Tolman was in the Air Force at the time Dr. Luth left, and in that little, that interim uh, between the time that Dean Luth left and before Perry Tolman was discharged from the Air Force, uh, we had Reuben Saxon, our operating superintendent, who was acting dean. Yes, he was superintendent of, of, of hospital and grounds, as I recall. Yeah, yeah, right. Operating, they call uh, it. Operating engineer. And uh, we had um, um, Alan Mosher uh, directing the medical mm -hmm. services. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, well, Perry had been brought up in Nebraska and had been professor of pathology, um, was acquainted with uh, a good bit of Nebraska's history and background and problems. Um, and although a, a competent dean was never a forceful dean, uh, in that he um, did not seem to make things happen on the campus in the way of either changes in curriculum or in um, buildings or equipment. Um, he may have been anxious to get these particular things done, but uh, they just never seemed to happen. Well, it was during this time, was it not, that F. Lowell Dunn was appointed chairman of the Buildings Committee and the Quarter of a mill levy was put through the legislature for our capital improvement. But in the middle of all this development, then came the controversy on full time faculty, right? Uh, I don't remember the exact timing on that, but when I came on the campus in 19. 21 as a student, other than full-time faculty in the Department of um, the Preclinical Sciences, there were no full-time faculty people. That's right. Uh, when I came back on the campus in 1930 in December, the only faculty member that I, member that I can recall who was a paid faculty member was Leslie Kirk, who was the director of clinical clerks. Oh. Mm -hmm. He received a salary for his services. Kirk? Kirk, K-I-R-K. There's somebody you might get a hold of, too. Um, What's his Esley. first name? Uh, Esley. Yes, Esley. Esley. He's now retired. Oh, yes, I've seen He's that class name. class 26, I believe, or 27. Mm -hmm. Esley Kirk was a very flamboyant character when he came onto the campus because when he came on the campus, he had a convertible car and a wife. <laughs> Sounds like he was in the money. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was. 
<laughs> but married students were few and far between in those days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, full-time full -time people were few and far between in 1931. Um, it was shortly after I came back, probably in the mid-30s, and I can't remember the exact date, when the department was by the United States government to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Willis, uh, Brown? Brown, yeah. Dr. Willis Brown. But wasn't there a great deal of opposition to um, full-time clinical faculty and also opposition towards um, taking the federal money? I don't recall uh, any particular great opposition. I think there was some opposition in the Department of OB uh, when Dr. Brown came in because unfortunately his um, curriculum had not been outlined for him, job description had not been written. Um, the then pres uh, chairman of the department said, here's an office, here's a chair, here's the medical school, go to work. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and um, Willis Brown was a very energetic, ambitious young man who uh, tried to fill a lot of shoes and um, ran into some problems, some of which were as great as the ones which occurred the subsequent appointment. But, um, <laughs> He did have some problems with the with the part-time staff. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. I think a lot of that was all due to the fact that uh, there was no job description written for him. Mm -hmm. Well, then they called in Leon S. Maluka to come and straighten that for the No, part. no, no, no. <laughs> that wasn't. <laughs> Willis Brown had come and gone, and there were other people along the way. Willis Brown was here in 1930s. And that was with Dr. when Dr. Sage, I think, was chairman of the department, uh -huh. and that would have been in, in the in the late thirties, and um, it was after Dr. Sage's retirement as chairman of the department that uh, we ran into the difficulties with the full-time individual who was also chairman of the department. And that would have been in uh, 5051. Yes. So there was, a, there was a quite a hiatus in there. Uh, uh, Dr. O'Dell. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lester O'Dell. Yeah. At the time that um, um, I was asked to assume acting chairmanship of the department in 1950. Um, there were other changes occurring in, in staff and faculty. And um, Dr. Willis Moody became chairman of the Department of Medicine. Mm -hmm. Dr. Herbert Davis became chairman of the Department of Surgery. Dr. Herman Yar was Chairman of the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, we all uh, found and appointed juniors in the staff department. Um, the philosophy being that if you could bring a young man in from the outside who was full-time but not director of the department um, who could become acquainted with the um, 
part-time faculty or the volunteer faculty, uh, and they could become acquainted with him and they could be used to working with one another, uh, that the eventual transition of the medical school to a large full-time faculty would be much easier and, and more acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, uh, all of us uh, relinquished the chairmanships of our department in the spring of 56. And um, people who had been in the various departments on a full-time basis but with junior appointments now became chairman of the department. Um, Dr. Roy Holly became chairman of the department OBGYN. Um, Dr. Grissom? Um, Grissom became the chairman of the department of medicine. Um, Dr. Gibbs? Dr. Gibbs became chairman of the department of uh, pediatrics and Jim Musselman became chairman of surgery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. At the time that, well maybe it's actually put it this way, when was the residency program for our department of OBGYN uh, accredited? And how many residents did you have? Let's go back to my notes on that. I'd have to go back well, to my notes on that, Ms. Hetzner, but um, uh, the first resident, there was one resident, and that was a young man by the name of Dr. Russell Hosey, H-O-S-I-E, who was in a pyramidal residency program at Chicago Line Inn. And, um, um, with an arrangement with Chicago Lion Inn, he was appointed as a resident at University of Nebraska uh, on an equal rank of a third year resident at Chicago Lion Inn. Oh. Mm -hmm. And our residency was accepted on a third year level. Mm -hmm. And that was during the time that Dr. Earl Sage was chairman of the department. And would probably have been in 1937, 38, 39, I can go along on. in there someplace. I can look it up. I can't, yeah. but it, I'm, I'm sure it was before the uh, uh, conflagration of World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, the following year, um, we accepted a, a resident from um, Washington University in St. Louis, Dr. Herman Gardner. And was this also an advance? Uh, and this was a, again a third year. We remained in that position of only a third year resident uh, until after the, uh, the cessation of um, war activities. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. That would be about 1946? 1946. And with that, then we, we established a three year program. The exact history of, of the residency programs and other departments you'll have to get from them, <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> Try and get that from Herbert Davis and some mm -hmm. people like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well then I think the next um, uh, big stir on the campus was when uh, we decided that we needed to expand uh, the capital improvement program and uh, there was some discussion, do we go east, do we go west, do we go north uh, with the campus and um, from looking at some of our scrapbooks there was quite a bit of discussion on that and a group of um, volunteer faculty that approved such a move and others thought that the University Hospital was big enough the way it was. Um, <clears throat> I remember when I was um, on the campus uh, in the 30s and 40s uh, that the University had a, acquired from time to time 
uh, property on the north side of Dewey Avenue between um, the railroad tracks uh, on the west and 42nd Street on the east. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that particularly because there used to be a couple of lots down west of 44th Street on Dewey yes. that the Pikeyes looked at to purchase to build a fraternity house and discovered that uh, uh, they were being looked at by the university and we thought there was no sense in buying them <laughs> at that time. So we did not go into that. Mm -hmm. um, the um, school did own some property, however, which was eventually leased to the Lutheran Hospital. Yes. Uh, and they had a, a five-year lease at the end of which time they were supposed either to renew it or release it. Um, during the five years um, that the Lutherans had a lease on this property, they had talked rather vigorously about putting up a private hospital. Um, and when it came within uh, six or eight months of Renewing the lease, there was a good bit of pressure put on the Lutheran board by people not on the board to uh, not renew the lease. Um, some of these were medical people, some of them were not. Um, some of the medical people said that um, if you build a private hospital across the street from the university, it's not going to be long until with full-time staff, that your staff will be taken over by the full-time people at the university. You will no longer have an independent hospital, but you will have a university-oriented <laughs> hospital. Mm -hmm. This argument was so well presented to the Lutheran board uh, that they did not renew the lease, which was immediately picked up by the Clarkson, Clarkson. Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I knew that, that Lutheran had one time mm -hmm. had decided, but I didn't know why they gave it up. Well, I mean, they I gave it up. They gave it up on the on on the basis that um, that um, they would be overwhelmed eventually by uh, um, university full time faculty who would gradually invade their hospital mm -hmm. with private patients mm -hmm. and eventually become directors of various departments, and they would no longer be basically an independent. Uh, institution they would be ruled and regulated by the rules and regulations of the Board of Regents. Mm -hmm. Indirectly, of course, but still ruled that way. Yeah. And uh, that has, e even after Clarkson uh, uh, built his hospital uh, and began functioning as an independent hospital, uh, that thought has reared its quote and unquote ugly head several times. Would you um, care to comment as to whether or not that is why Children's Hospital has made the uh, made the decision to leave the campus? Oh, I'm not familiar with all of the political problems that have arisen at Children's Hospital. Um, when uh, the Dorley family and the Omaha World Herald uh, promoted the idea of the Children's Hospital, um, it was promoted on the idea that it would be a teaching hospital for both schools in medicine in the city, both Creighton and Nebraska. Um, the location of that hospital in the neutral piece of ground was one of the points that Crichton uh, insisted upon. Uh, when, however, the board at Children's leased the land from the university to build on their present quarters, um, the um, Crichton um, School of Medicine uh, withdrew its support oh. because their idea was that um, leasing the land from the university, locating the, the hospital so close to 
the University of Nebraska College of Medicine would give a children's hospital that was dominated by the uh, University of Nebraska with only a very minor role being played by an, an off-campus group such as Creighton. That was one of the early controversies. Um, another controversy that happened at Children's that affected its program for a long time was the fact that uh, in its original organization, um, Children's staff was to be limited children's active staff was to be limited to uh, people who were pediatricians or specialists boarded in their respective specials. Uh, this immediately antagonized all of the <laughs> private general practitioners who now found that they could not admit a child to children's hospital under their name. It would have to be admitted under the name of a full-time uh, closed hospital staff membership uh, and they would no longer have control of medical care of that particular yep. patient. Um, the, the census of children therefore was low until they uh, revised that particular hospital admission uh, policy and uh, let uh, general practitioners become active members and mm -hmm. remain in control of their patients. Mm -hmm. Um, there's never been a, a uh, satisfactory working between um, the Department of Pediatrics at the University, as I see it, even though Dr. Yard tried desperately to do so, uh, and Children's Hospital, because again, um, I feel that um, the Children's Board um, was fearful of uh, domination of the university on their hospital policies. Mm -hmm. um, Clarkson Hospital really didn't help in, in uh, solving some of the programs uh, because they continued to maintain a pediatric department mm -hmm. uh, within a block of a children's hospital. Mm -hmm. um, at one time, um, the university presented to the children's board a program of leasing so many beds from the children's hospital uh, on an annual basis and moving their children's department over there. Uh, mm -hmm. But that was blocked so because, again, of letting the camel's head inside the tent. The whole camel <laughs> would move in very shortly. Yeah. Um, some of the more recent uh, objections to staying uh, on the campus uh, close to the university has been quoted and quote that the university does not allow them sufficient room for parking. Oh, dear. Uh, yes. And that uh, when parking is available, it's hazardous to the people who park their cars because of the, the location of the hospital. Um, <laughs> uh, a third thing that, another thing that happened is that in the um, workings of the hospital, um, administration, they needed some help, and they appealed to John Estabrook at Methodist to help them out. And, uh, he sent a one of his staff to help administer some of the hospital problems. And shortly after that, the Department of Radiology and the Department of Pathology at Methodist uh, took over the respective departments of children's. Um, and uh, Methodist has really had a good bit of um, input into the management and conduct of children's hospital for quite some number of years, long before uh, the idea of moving children to a separate wing of Methodists. I see. So your analogy about the camel <laughs> really does work. Yeah, it did work in this it particular instance, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only it was a different camel it this time. It was a different camel, came under <laughs> a different guise. They invited yeah. the camel in this <laughs> <It> time. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, these are, I, I think, I think facts that can be verified and, and would, yeah. you know, really bear a little bit of, a, of a further uh, investigation on somebody who wants to really do some research on, mm -hmm. on the history of the, of the mm -hmm. uh, Methodist Hospital, Children's Hospital. I think it would mm -hmm. be very interesting and, and I am sure that um, John Estabrook uh, and Jerry Schenken or even Rudy Schenken 
can give you uh, lots of the um, political, medical um, program changes that have been going on for the two institutions mm -hmm. over a long period of time. Well, I um, will explore that when I uh, talk to Dr. Schenken. I try to he, get He may deny all that. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, uh, I can't say I can't say that I didn't say that because you got it on tape. <laughs> <laughs> well, I um, asked Dr. Hunt the same question, and um, uh, we'll see how all the inversions <laughs> come out. <laughs> So, um, well, I think probably uh, Dr. Ralph Moore would know yes. any more about that than Dr. Hunt would. Well, that's what Dr. Hunt said. That, uh, that Dr. You know, Moore was in the diagnostic there. end and Dr. Hunt was in the therapeutic end and uh, the two really didn't see eye to eye to one another as far as managing a, a chairmanship mm -hmm. of a department. And there would be very little therapeutics of children's compared to what there would yes. be in the way of, of diagnostic work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, now you've been uh, in, go ahead. Uh, as far as the rest of the campus expansion controversy was oh, concerned, yes. um, there was a lot of oh, yes. opposition by landowners to expansion of the campus east, uh, but a lot of that has disappeared as, uh, as um, the University uh, Board of Regents has supplied money to, to buy um, land to the east of us. Of course, I think one of the fortunate things that happened in one way for the university, but unfortunate as far as the institution uh, concerned was, um, the eventual um, closing of the uh, convent and uh, the placing of the uh, house of the Good Shepherd for sale uh, and eventually uh, the university acquiring that piece of property, uh, which gives them a considerable amount of land for expansion to the east in the future mm -hmm. because basically they can't expand uh, much further to the north because of uh, Dodge Street. Yes. Um, they could jump the tracks, I suppose, and expand west of the Missouri Pacific. Um, south, they've got the Missouri Pacific and Leavenworth. Yes. Mm -hmm. So basically their expansion, easiest expansion, is by going to the east. Mm -hmm. And I, I think at the present time they may have enough land available now for expansion in the foreseeable future, uh, particularly if the um, consolidation of parking spaces can be arranged so that we don't take up too much flat space with parking cars. Maybe the OPEC nations will take care of that. Maybe. They may take care of that or there may be some new things that will happen that will allow us to do vertical instead of longitudinal parking with cars yes. at a much less expensive um, building cost than they are at the present time. Or if um, um, Stapleton staff housing in the area became more desirable. And of course the big impetus to expansion came with the, with the, the um, appointment of Dr. Whitson yes. um, to the um, chancellorship. And, 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 the, and the history of Dr. Whitson is an interesting one, too, because he came in as a director of the Nebraska Psychiatric Institute and uh, was a very effective and progressive director down there. While he was director there, Dr. Richard Young was chairman of the Department of Neurology and Psychiatry mm -hmm. at the university. And then Dr. Young had to uh, resigned because of his development of a severe Parkinsonian syndrome, which left the chair of neuropsychiatry empty. The, um, I don't know whether I should tell you this or not. All right, go ahead. <laughs> uh, the search committee yeah. um, interviewed a good many people and made a recommendation that Dr. Rick Whitton, Robert Whitton, be appointed as director, mm -hmm. uh, no, be appointed as chairman of the Department of, of Psychiatry and mm -hmm. Neurology. I think this is right. Yeah. Um, 
the um, um, administration, however, uh, overrode the recommendations of the search committee <laughs> and appointed <laughs> Dr. Woodson. <laughs> I didn't Did you realize, know that? No, I, but I didn't realize they had search committees back in those days. Well, it was a committee that was appointed like a search committee. Yeah. Now, From the executive sure. faculty, probably. Now, that may have been director of the Psychiatric Institute. I'm not sure. It was either the chairmanship of the Psychiatric Institute, one of the two. Well. But uh, I think it was chairmanship of the department. Well, we can check on the dates of... Yeah. Uh, uh, the death of Dr. Richard Young. But I know that the, the two of them, of the two of them, were in very strong competition for an appointment, and that uh, mm -hmm. um, people had interviewed both Dr. Wigton and Dr. Whitson, and uh, most of the people were in favor of Dr. Wigton, and uh, but the Whitson people won out. <laughs> well, when he first came here, the uh, the psychiatric. Uh, unit was over in Douglas County Hospital, right? Probably. And yes, and he was um, instrumental in um, uh, designing this building on the campus here and getting support from various uh, sources, locally, federally, federally, and and so forth. And um, when I talked to George Round, he. Um, told me that he was in on um, the negotiations uh, to mm -hmm. put together that package that made that building and the operation, the subsequent operation uh, of NPI. Uh, very interesting story, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> well, there's an interesting story there, that, and then I would, I'm recalling memories of things that I haven't uh, thought about for a long time, and uh, accuracy may be a little bit foggy, but uh, I do know that there was a controversy between the appointment of the two, and that uh, the, the administration overruled the recommendation. When I <laughs> talk to Woodson, I'll see if I can find out, <laughs> but he probably won't tell me either. No. We were talking about the campus expansion and Dr. Woodson's um, part in this. Well, Dr. Dr. Woodson seemed to be uh, not didn't seem to be, but Dr. Whitson is an individual who is um, uh, an expert m on uh, being able to um, envision um, future growth in medical schools, uh, particularly at Nebraska, and to be able to uh, take that vision and put it into um, blueprints and find the money with which to uh, transfer the blueprints into actual buildings, and in the vast majority of cases, find the money to maintain the building after it's once been built. Uh, probably there has never been a period of expansion of uh, medical facilities in the University of Nebraska Medical School uh, that equals what was accomplished during the time that he was Chancellor and uh, I mean being in the medical school and eventually Chancellor. Mm -hmm. um, certainly um, the um, development of the um, um, Woodson Hall, the library, um, the Epley Institute, um, mm -hmm. the second edition of the Epley Institute, um, the acquirement of the land across the street, um, the building of, um, or at least the initiation of the building of, um, of um, school of um, pharmacy, and the college of nursing, and the college of nursing, mm -hmm. um, either had their initiation in or consummation of um, during his uh, service. In the development of the Myers. Uh, the development of, the, of uh, well, I'm not sure exactly when that occurred, but I think that was in part of the Whitson regime, the Myers Institute, the Lord School for Handicapped Children, the moving of the Hattie B. Monroe home onto the campus, mm -hmm. uh, and the development of a children's center that um, really was, was unique in the United States. Um, and uh, I, I'm sorry to see children's leave. Uh, I'm sorry to see that the 
services that had to be Monroe or changed, but that whole institution was built on the basis of care of handicapped children with um, uh, polio and um, and uh, heart disease, mm -hmm. effects of acute rheumatic fever, mm -hmm. and uh, those two diseases are slowly disappearing so that uh, uh, the need for care in that particular field is um, certainly lessened. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, newer things, of course, are the children that are handicapped by congenital and genetic mm -hmm. uh, factors. So that the Hattie B. Monroe home um, has changed its uh, character and its policy. Um, the Meyer Institute and, and the Lord School um, are still serving a very large population uh, rehabilitation. Of